Hi guys, welcome to part 2 of my Filmic Log version 2 tutorial. If you haven't watched part 1 yet, you might want to do that. I show you the best way to shoot Filmic Log version 2 using a color managed workflow. Shooting is only the beginning. Now I'm going to show you a foolproof, accurate and easy way to color correct your video files. Once you understand the tools and the method, this is paint by numbers easy, you can't get it wrong. Everything I'm going to show you works in the free version of DaVinci Resolve, so don't worry if you don't have the studio version. Resolve may be free, but it does have some minimum system requirements, and it won't run on a computer that doesn't meet the minimums. This isn't going to be a step-by-step -step introduction to Resolve, so I'm assuming some prior knowledge, or that you've already watched my introductory color correction concepts video. But if you're familiar with any desktop editing software, you should be able to follow along. In Resolve's media page, I'll start by navigating to the directory where I've transferred all my video clips from the phone using iTunes file sharing. I'll create a bin in my project for these clips and drag them all into my bin. I'll make another bin for my timelines. Now I can switch to the edit page and find all my clips are in the bin. What I normally do is create a timeline that contains every video clip for a project. And I use this timeline to review shots and make selections for my edit. But it's also useful for color correcting shots using the reference chart because these clips haven't been trimmed yet. I can select all of them, right click and create a new timeline containing all the selected shots. I'll drag that timeline into my timeline bin to keep things organized. Each clip includes a few seconds of the X-Rite Color Checker Passport video chart at the start of each clip. A few notes in passing. This is an HD resolution timeline, but the shots are 4K. My computer's an older MacBook Pro. It isn't strong enough to play these clips in real time inside of Resolve, so I use Resolve's render cache to transcode them. I've set it up so Resolve creates temporary ProRes 422HQ files in a cache directory, which my computer will play no problem. These temporary files are recreated any time you make a change to the clip. Now the fun part, I'll switch to the color page. I'll select the first clip in my timeline and place the playhead over a frame where the X-Rite color chart is clear and free of any shadows or reflections. In the node tree, I'll right click and choose to create a new serial node. I'll rename this node Primary Correction. While I've said before in my other Resolve tutorial that it's important to separate your color operations into different nodes, everything I'm going to show you now can be done on a single node. The first thing I'm going to do is open my scopes. I need two scopes for this, Waveform and Vectorscope. The Waveform plots the luminance or brightness information of your image from 0, which is black, to 1023, which is white. It also splits RGB color information apart, which allows you to see color balance. If I switch to the parade scope, you can see it's doing the same thing, but splits color components out into completely separate readings instead of overlaying them. The reading of the whole image on the scopes is a bit confusing. All I care about right now is the X-Rite color chart. So I'm going to head down to my power windows, which is the tab with the oval mask on it. I'm going to select the rectangle mask and then adjust the corners of the rectangle to fit the corners of the chart. Now see what happens to the scopes when I click the highlight icon above the viewer. Things are a lot clearer now. I'm only seeing the chart on the scopes. The waveform, and if I switch to the parade, 
are now showing the luminance levels of all the different chips on the chart. The vector scope only cares about two things, hue and saturation. You can see the signal leads out from the center towards the boxes. These are the main row of color chips. The center of the scope indicates zero saturation. The further out the signal, the more saturated these hues are. If I reduce saturation to zero, you'll see the information on the vector scope retreats to a central dot, indicating there's no hue and no saturation. I'll bring saturation back up. This is still showing us too much information all at once. The first step is we'll correct white, middle gray, and black. I'll select the power window tool on the bottom of the viewer and adjust the mask to show me only the three chips I need right now. Let's look at the waveform. Now you can see only three lines. The highest tells us the recorded luminance level of light reflecting off the white chip. The middle one shows us the recorded level of the light reflecting off the gray chip, and the lowest level shows us the black point. For most purposes, you'll be color correcting and grading into the default Rec. 709 color space. This is the standard for HDTV and suitable for everything you're most likely to do with your finished videos. I want the white chip to be around 90% on the scope, so that's somewhere around 900. The black can be close to zero. I let it hover around the bottom of the scope. I'll use the curve to make these adjustments. As I add points to the curve and adjust up or down, you'll see the levels on the waveform change too. If you've set your white balance correctly in camera, you should be seeing only one white line for each chip. If the line is split apart into red, green, and blue, then you need to correct your white balance. I'll switch to the parade scope. This splits up the color channels and you can see more clearly. If all three match exactly, then your white balance is correct. There are four color wheels, lift, gamma, gain, and offset. Let's play with each one and see what happens on the scopes. I can use the lift control to adjust only the shadow parts of the image. I can raise or lower the overall level of the shadows without affecting color balance at all. And I can manipulate the color balance too. The color wheel is arranged so that red, green, and blue primary colors and cyan, magenta, and yellow secondary colors are arranged opposite each other around the wheel. You'll notice this is the same arrangement of colors as on the vector scope. If I move the control from the center towards red, the red channel increases in value. This represents an increase in red, but an equal decrease in cyan. Whichever direction I move the control changes the balance of red, green, and blue channels towards that color. The same applies to the gamma control, only I'm affecting the midtones more than anything else. The gain is exactly the same, but only affects the brightest values in the image. When correcting white balance, I'll typically use the offset control. Take a close look at the RGB parade, or switch to waveform. Either can work, and see which color channel is higher than the others. That's the one I'll bring down, so grab the center of the offset control and move it away from the direction of that color. Watch the scope and move it to match up all three channels on the white chip. When it's even, all three channels in the parade scope will align. Or if you're looking at the waveform, you'll see a single white line, not separated colors. If for any reason the black or gray are still not correct, I'll grab the center of the lift color wheel and adjust it so the black level is equal in all color channels. At this point, gray should be lined up too, but if not for some reason, you can correct it the same way using the gamma color wheel. The goal here between the offset, lift, gamma, gain, and curve adjustments is to perfectly correct the white balance and have the white level hit around 900 on the scope, the gray hit around 400 on the scope, and the black somewhere close to zero. Once I've accomplished that, I can move on to color and saturation.
It's now time to select the power window tool again and move the mask to reveal the color chips. I'll go ahead and reveal the skin tone chips too. This time we aren't concerned with the waveform or RGB parade, we're only concerned with the vector scope. Open the settings of the vector scope and make sure the 2 times checkbox is selected. Take a look at the vector scope. This is the paint by numbers part. Your six color chips need to align with the boxes. So I'll go back to my curves, but this time I'll switch to the hue versus hue curve. I'll select each of the small circles, which will put control points in my curve for each of the three primary colors and each of the three secondary colors. Now grab them one by one and adjust them until the line for each color aligns in the direction of the box. That looks spot on, so next I'll correct saturation. Switch the curve to hue versus sat. Again, hit the six dots to put control points in the curve in the right places. Now I can adjust saturation for each color. Watch the vector scope and adjust until each line is centered in the box. Notice the skin tone hues are all lined up on the skin tone hue indicator on the vector scope. This means my skin tones are also now correct. That's all there is to it. I can now turn off the highlight tool, remove the power window, and the shot is technically color corrected. I can now right click on the viewer and save this into my stills gallery. This saved correction can now be used for that shot in my edit. This process is very accurate and takes all the guesswork out of color correction, as long as I've shot the chart correctly, meaning it was evenly lit by the main light source, which in my case is usually the sun. You will need to do this for each individual shot where you've recorded a new chart. And you should have recorded a new chart any time the light changes or your camera position or angle to the light has changed in any meaningful way. There are some situations where this method may not give you accurate colors and might not work at all. In the accompanying article I've included some tips for when the chart can't be your only source of reference. You'll find the link to the article in the video description. In most outdoor and well-lit situations, what I've shown you will work perfectly every time, as long as you've shot the chart and exposed properly. Of course, this workflow is not the only workflow, but it's the one I employ with Filmic Log version 2 and it works very well for me. I hope it helps you to improve the accuracy and consistency of colors in your own videos when you're shooting with Filmic Log version 2. 
Remember to subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.